Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the recent updates to the pediatric ARV guidelines, and specifically I'll be talking about testing and prophylaxis for infants with HIV exposure. I have no current conflict of interest or relationships to disclose. This is our standard disclaimer. I will add my additional disclaimer that sometimes I have the ten tendency to misspeak in presentations. So if I say something that doesn't quite make sense, please feel free to ask about it. And I also don't claim to represent the entire committee on any of my attempts to explain the rationale for some of the nuances in the, in the guidelines. So the objectives for the talk today are to discuss the current recommendations for ARB management for infants with perinatal exposure, HIV exposure, to discuss the current recommendations for diagnostic testing, and to highlight some of the changes in the U.S. pediatric guidelines and provide the rationale for these changes. And all of the guidelines can be found at this, the clinical info, HIV .hiv .gov website. Just a few definitions. ARV prophylaxis is, as it sounds, the administration of drugs to a newborn without documented HIV infection to reduce the risk for acquisition. Presumptive HIV therapy is the administration of a three-drug ARV regimen to newborns at highest risk for HIV acquisition. This obviously also provides ARV prophylaxis. And then it's considered therapy when the infant is known to be infected and they're actually being treated. So, in the talk, I've highlighted the sections that were new. Some aren't actual new recommendations, but just clarifications that were felt to be needed to be made um, in the previous guidelines. And one of the things that was different in the guidelines was a, a slightly more nuanced um, stratification of risk. So the infants at low risk of perinatal HIV transmission are considered those born to someone who is currently receiving and had received at least 10 weeks consecutive weeks of antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy, has sustained antenatal viral suppression from that point to the end of pregnancy, and then the definition of sustained antenatal viral suppression was further clarified as at least two consecutive tests obtained at least four weeks apart that had an RNA level less than the lower limit of detection. And these women who are at low risk for transmission to their infants also include no issues with adherence, um, the infant is greater than, is a term infant, and there was not acute HIV during pregnancy. And the, the change is that the reduction of zidobutene from four weeks down to two weeks. This is the same as what's in the British HIV Association guidelines, and we mentioned them the year before, but had been unwilling to adopt them without some further additional data. So what's the rationale for dropping the four weeks down to two weeks? Partly it's the continued recognition that in these really low-risk parents, the risk of transmission if the person has been on antiretrovirals prior to conception and maintain a, a suppressed viral load and was suppressed at delivery is extremely low. This is um, data from the French perinatal cohort that had over 8,000 women, and they also now have a, an update that was published in CID in 2023 with uh, further data on another 5,400 women who were on ART at the time of conception and with a viral load less than 50 who had zero transmission. So the transmission rate is really low, particularly for those women who started ARVs early and maintained a suppressed viral load. Further rationale comes for this specifically for the two weeks is that it also reduces toxicities for the infants. So this um, was a study, retrospective review of births from two hospitals in Germany. They had 312 infants that they reviewed, a little less than half who received two weeks of zidovudine. The rest received more than two weeks. They found no transmissions in the two-week group, and there was significantly less anemia in the infants that received the two weeks of zidovudine versus the greater than two weeks. And then the Swiss guidelines have recommended no infant post-exposure prophylaxis. 
for these infants who were at low risk of HIV since 2016. There's an abstract from the European AIDS Conference in 2019 reviewing 87 infants born during this period that did not receive ARV post-exposure prophylaxis with no HIV transmissions reported. I was unable to find anything actually published on this, but further this just verbal communication from the Swiss group has confirmed that this is ongoing and they have not seen any unexpected transmissions. So that's the rationale for going down to accepting the two weeks we I think the committee was uncomfortable going to no prophylaxis at this point just due to the lack of the real lack of data on that and recognizing that there may be times when um, a birthing parent appears to be really low risk and perhaps isn't and you might find that information later at least the infant is covered initially for with um, some post exposure prophylaxis at that time. So the definition for high risk is not different. Um, these are infants born to, to a person who did not receive antiretrovirals during pregnancy or received only interparum or had antiretrovirals but they did not have a sustained viral sus um, suppression. also includes someone who had acute or primary HIV during pregnancy. What was clarified in this is that we've always recommended or for the last several years presumptive HIV therapy with either Zidovudine, lamivudine, nevirapine, or zidovudine, 3TC, nevir, raltegravir. And the recommendation is two to six weeks duration for all three drugs, and that's an area of, of nuance. The clarification was that if the three-drug regimen is discontinued prior to six weeks, then zidovudine should be continued for a total of six weeks of prophylaxis. That then leaves this third group of infants who are neither meet the scenario of extremely low risk or high risk. And this would include infants who are premature, but otherwise at low risk for transmission. And these infants should receive four to six weeks of zidobine. The definition for presumed neonatal exposure didn't change. So women who, or birthing parents who did not have HIV testing during pregnancy and were tested at delivery and there's a, or had additional risk factors. So they were tested at delivery and had a positive maternal serology. Those infants should be started on presumptive HIV therapy. And then that can be discontinued if the supplemental testing does not confirm the HIV infection in the parent. So how long to continue to three drug preemptive antiretroviral therapy in an infant at high risk for HIV transmission? So the guidelines say can maybe continue for two to six weeks. So one of the reasons is that it's difficult to make really specific recommendations in this. The only clear recommendation is that if an infant confirms is infected, then three drug ART should be continued and it should be converted to HIV ART therapy as soon as possible. And in that would in that case it would be switching if they started on the varipine, switching to raltegravir if possible or to dolutegravir if the infant is at least four weeks of age. But for the other group, the, there's just a lot of different considerations. If, uh, for example, if the parent had a viral load of 400,000 at delivery, that infant is at very high risk of peripartum transmission, in which case you probably would, would want to continue all three drugs for at least four weeks as in standard adult post-exposure prophylaxis in a high-risk situation. If the reason they don't meet low risk is that they had acute HIV infection in the early second trimester, for example, started on antiretrovirals, were completely suppressed at delivery, then the risk of transmission is in utero transmission primarily. And so if the infant's initial testing is negative, and then their ongoing risk for peripartum transmission was probably less, and you may not feel as that it was necessary to have all three drugs for that length of time. So it's really a, a difficult to make it a definitive recommendation for how long to give three drugs in this situation. There's also always the availability of the experts in pediatric HIV that can be accessed through the National Clinician Consultation Center, which used to be called the perinatal hotline, and that's run out of UCSF, and that's the phone number. So fortunately, um, you already had a presentation by Judy Levison on the changes to the infant feeding recommendations. So I'll only discuss the recommendations for infant management when breastfed. I did not highlight all of these slides because these are all new in this year's, in this year's guidelines. 
And there were no definitive recommendations provided in the guidelines for what the infant ARV prophylaxis should be while being breastfed. Um, it's really an area for shared decision making with the breastfeeding parent based on risk considerations, tolerance, their confidence, and their ability to stay suppressed on ART. And the the suggestions went anywhere from the standard two weeks of now standard two weeks of zidovudine for low risk parents, or four to six weeks of zidovudine or nevirapine or nevirapine or another antiretroviral such as lamivudine or kelitra throughout the duration of breastfeeding. And some of the data that was looked at to try to make these recommendations, the Impact Promise study, which was uh, conducted primarily in Africa, 2,400 women with HIV who were randomized to maternal ART versus infant nevirapine during breastfeeding. The transmission rate was less than 1% at 12 months in both arms. At 18 months, it was slightly lower in the maternal ART arm. And there really was therefore not a significant difference between the infants receiving nevirapine all the way through breastfeeding versus the women being on triple drug ART. There were two infants in this group in the maternal ART arm who acquired HIV, even though the maternal viral load was less than 40 copies at the time of the infants tested positive. However, they pulled back previous samples and earlier samples that had detectable viral loads. There are other reports of infants who were infected with HIV via breastfeeding, even though maternal viral loads were suppressed. There's a paper by Giuliano in PLOS1 in 2013. However, there are no data on the specific situation that is described in the guidelines for breastfeeding parents, which is on antiretrovirals prior to throughout pregnancy, fully suppressed at delivery on maintaining their antiretrovirals during breastfeeding and being monitored closely. So we just really don't have that data. There was a recent paper published by Judy Levison and colleagues that was a retrospective analysis from sites in U.S. and Canada, included 72 infants. There were 68 who had been tested at least six weeks after weaning that they had the data on, and there were no transmissions in those 68 in this group, which were there was a huge range of what, of what providers did. It ranged anywhere from six weeks of nevirapine or zidovudine to a three-drug ART throughout breastfeeding, which is the Canadian recommendation. Another study was the BAN study, which was breastfeeding antiretrovirals and nutrition, um, which was conducted in Malawi. They randomized 263 women to either maternal antiretrovirals during breastfeeding, infant nevirapine, or no antiretrovirals. They had 221 um, mothers who had had, that had at least one paired plasma viral load and breast milk viral load. And fewer than 1% of the breast milk samples had detectable RNA when the paired plasma RNA was less than 40 So there was a good correlation between plasma viral load and what was detected in the breast milk. Their lower limit of detection for breast milk was 56 copies per mil. But what they also found was that there was a very clear association between breast milk transmission and detectable HIV RNA in breast milk with a hazard ratio of almost four. They had 116 women in in this group that had plasma viral loads at all the time points that they intended. And this was only a 28-week study. So this was only through 24 weeks of breastfeeding. But they had these, the 116 women had viral loads at enrollment 2, 6, 12, 18, and 24 weeks. And in the group of women that had all those tests done and had viral loads less than 100 copies per mil, there were no breast milk transmission. So again, implying that suppressed on antiretrovirals provides suppression in breast milk, and that prevents transmission. So what are the, some of the considerations that you might use if you're counseling a woman about breastfeeding and, and thinking about some of the arguments for and against adding additional antiretroviral prophylaxis in the infants? So some arguments against it are, as just detailed, there are multiple studies showing very low risk for HIV transmission via breastfeeding when the parent is receiving antiretroviral therapy, well, suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. There have been no transmissions documented from women who meet the criteria for low risk proposed by the guidelines, but 
there are actually no studies that with this exact situation to be able to say that definitively. There's no clear additional benefit to the addition of infant antiretrovirals over maternal ART. And then, of course, by continuing antiretrovirals in the infant, there's the potential toxicity for, you know, these prolonged antiretroviral therapy, and usually which is zidovidine or nevirapine have been the most usual studied. And then there's always the challenges to administering medication to infants, not to mention the cost and inconvenience. On the other side, there's the considerations for... um, not for for recommending additional infant antiretroviral prophylaxis. One is that, as shown, we know that the risk is increased with increased maternal plasma viral load during breastfeeding. And there are multiple studies that show that maternal adherence to ART and viral load suppression decrease after delivery. Anyone who's had a baby or, you know, lived with someone who had a baby knows that life is not the same when you have a newborn. And there are a lot of challenges in just managing standard life, much less managing your all your medications. And so it's not surprising that this is a really high risk time. There's a, a paper by this, I don't know how you pronounce the last name, Wait, that has a really nice review of all the data that sort of addresses the, the question about what's the best prophylaxis for infants during breastfeeding that is a recommended reading if you're interested. So therefore, if you provided infant ARV prophylaxis during breastfeeding, you would provide additional protection for the infants if there is breakthrough viremia during breastfeeding. There's also data that cell-associated HIV DNA is associated with breast milk transmission, and this is most noticeable during the early postpartum period because colostrum has more cells and early breast milk has more cells, and maternal ART has less effect on cell-associated HIV DNA load in breast milk. That's really the rationale, I think, why the Canadians recommend three-drug antiretrovirals during breastfeeding for infants is because of the additional risk of the cell-associated HIV DNA. What we have chosen to recommend at the University of Washington is the six weeks of either zidovudine or nevirapine for the women who are breastfeeding. And again, the rationale is that that covers that really high risk period for perhaps lapses in adherence at the, you know, right after that, in that post early postpartum time, and also covers the time where there's more, potentially more cell associated HIV DNA in the early breast milk. An example of when you might A woman might choose to do nevirapine or lamivudine, for example, throughout breastfeeding would be someone who really wants to breastfeed, but is just very nervous about the risk of doing so. And this might give them added confidence to be able to breastfeed if they're on the fence. So it really is a shared decision-making model, which makes it extremely challenging at this point with the data we have to be really definitive on what the appropriate response, what recommendations should be for people who are wanting to breastfeed their infants. So switching to infant diagnosis, no changes in the timing for diagnostic testing in infants, which in standard is two to three weeks after delivery, one to two months after delivery, and then four to six months after delivery. For infants who are at high risk of perinatal HIV infection, there's a recommendation for an additional testing to be done at birth. And then at two to six weeks after the anti- the, the combination antiretroviral drugs are discontinued. And the only change really was just the clarification as to why that additional recommendation is the concern that combination ARV prophylaxis or presumptive HIV therapy in particular may reduce the sensitivity of diagnostic testing. So in putting this in in tabular form, the idea behind the infants at higher risk for transmission and why you would do the additional testing is that if they're at risk for in utero infection, you would want that birth testing to be able to know if you can, when you can stop or if you can stop um, the preemptive HIV therapy as well, because that's the, you would miss that if you only tested them at 14 to 21 days. Um, and then for the infants that are low risk, they would not necessarily need that birth test or that additional test. Here's an example of why the additional testing um, for infants who are receiving additional antiretrovirals, this was a study by Burgard of timing of positive test in 65 infants who were documented to be HIV infected. And 
at the one month mark here, there both DNA and RNA PCR were less sensitive if the infant was on combination antiretroviral prophylaxis. And that's most noticeable in the plasma um, in the RNA assay and also those that had combination therapy, the viral load was lower with if they were on combination therapy. So there's the concern about missing an infected infant if the testing is done while the child is still on the combination therapy, hence the recommendation for doing an additional test once they're off. That also impacts the definition for presumptive and definitive exclusion of HIV infection. And so it was just clarified that, again, to meet the definition of presumptively negative or definitively negative, one of the tests should be at least two to four weeks after discontinuation of the multidrug ARB prophylaxis or presumptive therapy. And then for infants while breastfeeding, if a child becomes infected during breastfeeding, was it because it was breastfeeding or were they infected in utero before they even started breastfeeding? That would be good information. Also, the also would impact what kind of prophylaxis, obviously, the infant would receive. The other testing that's recommended is that they basically get the same testing as any other low-risk infant and that they should have testing every three months while breastfeeding. There was some discussion about the frequency of infant testing, and the upshot was that a min- everyone was comfortable with about a minimum of every three months. Some would do it more frequently. Clearly, the maternal testing is most important because if the breastfeeding parent is suppressed on ARVs, then their risk of transmission to the infant is less. And if there's a breakthrough, that's really where the, the important testing comes. So it's recommended that breastfeeding parent be tested every one to two months. And then the infants should be tested four to six weeks, three months and six months after weaning. And if the viral load in the parent becomes detectable while breastfeeding, the infant should be tested at that time and then follow the same testing schedule as as after birth. So those were the changes to the guidelines related to testing and management, particularly um, with around breastfeeding, which was which was new. I think that obviously we're already working on the guidelines for next year. There will be some nuances, I think, about some of the scenarios, maybe some clarification about some of the potential scenarios that show up during breastfeeding, but I don't think there will be substantial changes, but I can't really speak to those yet because they haven't been finalized. So thank you for your attention and appreciate any questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.